And so for uh, this lecture, again, we're trying to generate some curiosity and some interest before we just dive right into the math, okay? Why do we care about quantum mechanics? Well, it's only 100 years old. Think about science in general. I mean, that's, that's like an infant topic, <laughs> okay? And, and so what led us into this field? I mean, science had been pretty established. You learned from your history class uh, about the Industrial Revolution, and that was based on thermodynamics and steam. So we really did transform the world and still transforming the world with steam power. All of our electrical plants use steam generators or turbines. And, and the, so the, the idea of a gas, a working gas, a fluid that turns a turbine is how we power the world. And we've been doing that for 200 years okay, or more. And so where did quantum mechanics come from? And so that's what today's discussion is about. So before, let's go way back, before Einstein, before Schrodinger, before Planck and Boltzmann, even before Newton, we had Rene Descartes. And he was trying to figure out, 1629, he's trying to figure out, is there a reliable philosophy or way of getting at the truth? And so that's what he wrote in Rules for the Direction of the Mind. And he has several rules. It's a great read, pretty easy to read. Um, rule number four was there's a method, there needs to be a method for finding out the truth. And in the explanation of that method that he's, he's promoting in his philosophy book was math. And so he says this idea that, that math could be useful, uh, you know, there's really no guarantee that math would be useful. If you think about it, it's just scribbles on a page, right? <laughs> I mean, you go to math, you could sit in math class and, and do those scribbles all day long. What possible reason do you have to expect that that would represent what we see in nature. There's, that was brand new in 1629, this idea that math could describe nature. And so he wrote his book, Geometry, Brand New <coughs> Ideas. And guess who read his book, Geometry? Isaac Newton. <laughs> we know Newton, okay? You took physics, and that was all Newtonian physics, right? And that was all based upon Newton's grasp of math and calculus, which he was inspired to do when he read uh, Rene Descartes' geometry. And so this, this idea that, that Rene Descartes was talking about when he said there's a, a germ of useful thought that gets transferred from people to people, that's what we call memes now. Memes is kind of like this, this germ of a thought that goes from person to person and they go viral, just like a virus. Okay. And, and so this math was kind of like a, a, a useful thought that Rene Descartes developed in geometry, and then Isaac Newton caught that, and then developed calculus and this idea of mechanical view of nature, and it, it was so successful. In fact, this is how successful it was. When you've got poets writing about how successful your theories are, you, you're a success, right? That's sort of the viral idea, right? People not even related with your discipline are writing about what you've said and what you've done. And so this is Alexander Pope's poem about Newton. He said, nature and nature's law lay hid in night. And God said, let Newton be, and all was light. <laughs> okay, sort of trading on that Genesis language of God said, let there be light. Well, he, Alexander Pope says, Newton had such an influence on the way we view the world that all God had to do was just say, let Newton be and then everything would be lit up. So that's how popular and how pervasive Newtonian physics was. So we thought that we could basically predict the future. And if you think about it, you are predicting the future. If you have a cannon and it's aimed at this angle and you put so much powder in there that generates so much force and you know the weight of your projectile, you know where it's gonna land. You're predicting the future. And so they just extrapolated that to a mechanical view of the universe where if you knew the position and the momentum of every particle in the universe perfectly, you could predict the future with that mechanical view of the world. And so that was, that was just a triumph in terms of science. And, and then it bled into all these other disciplines, economics and sociology and psychology. Like if I know your brain state and your influences, I could predict your behavior. Well, we're, that's really not proven to be true. <laughs> Okay, we have a complicated mind-body problem, and that's a different course. That's a philosophy course. But the mind-body problem has not been solved by Newton. 
okay? And, and part of it is because of that knowledge. We don't know your brain state perfectly. Okay. So Rene Descartes passed that germ of math onto Isaac Newton, who passed it on to Boltzmann and Planck and Heisenberg. And Heisenberg really sort of shook the world in his mathematics, uh, looking at uh, quantum mechanics, where he said, you can't know the position and momentum of a particle perfectly. You may have heard of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Okay, and it has to do with the position and momentum uh, operators, these matrices of wave functions. And if you multiply them like position times uh, momentum and you subtract the momentum times position operation, it should equal zero. They should be commutative if they could both be known perfectly. And they're not commutative. There's an uncertainty piece. And so it depends upon which one you multiply first. And, and so this idea of Heisenberg, everybody thought, well, is this just a mathematical trick? Is this just an issue in the math or does this represent nature? And through many experiments, they realized this does represent nature. So there is an uncertainty built in to a particle's position and momentum. And you kind of have a, an idea of this if you're sitting at a, at a two-way stop so the cross traffic doesn't stop. And you glance to the right and you see a vehicle there but you just have a snapshot of the vehicle. You know it's positioned perfectly, but you don't know how fast it's going. You see, there's some uncertainty about its momentum. But if you sit there and look for a long time, you see how fast it's going, but now its position is blurred. It's not a perfect analogy, but it works. You know, if you take an instant picture of the position, you don't know the, the momentum. And if you average the momentum, you've lost the position information. And so that's kind of what they're talking about with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And then the math kept going through Louis de Broglie and de Broglie to Schrodinger and Schrodinger to Dirac. And so this is the pathway to our modern understanding of quantum mechanics. So let's go through some of these um, major achievements in science. So Max Planck, let me back up a little bit. Some of the failures of quantum mechanics that uh, failures of classical physics that quantum mechanics was developed to, to study um, were fourfold. One was the line spectra of atoms, specifically hydrogen, the simplest atom. Now they didn't really, uh, at that time there was a debate whether materials were atomistic or not, did atoms exist or not. Now we know that they do, but at the time they didn't believe that atoms existed. So they didn't know that hydrogen was a an atom with a single proton and a single electron. But they did know it was the lightest element. They knew that it had the simplest atomic spectrum. And the atomic spectrum of hydrogen gave discrete lines. And we'll see a slide on that in a minute. And then if you had helium, it gave different lines. So you had a different spectrum for helium and neon. So think about neon lights. You've got the different colors based on the different gases you have in each of those lights. So there, the spectrum depended upon the material but not so for the black body radiator. If you take uh, uh, your heating element in an electric stove and you turn it on high, it turns orange, doesn't it? If you had a copper heating element and you turn it up to the same temperature, it would give off the same color orange. It doesn't matter what material it's made out of. If you had a cop uh, uh, like a, a welding rod, you know, a, a graphite welding rod and you heated it up to the same temperature, it would glow with the same color. So that was bizarre. In atomic spectra, the spectrum depended upon the material that you had. But in the black body radiator, it was just related to the temperature. You get it to the same temperature, it has the same spectrum. So that's what we mean by black body radiators. There's this sort of, uh, the, the black part comes because if you want something to absorb or emit in infrared and the heat region of the spectrum, you need a rough surface. And really rough surfaces are black. So that's what, like black anodized aluminum and so on, those are, those are rough surfaces and they're black, okay? They absorb all wavelengths and emit all wavelengths. So that's what we mean by the black body radiator is that it's a rough surface, it emits and absorbs all wavelengths equally in the infrared. And this is the spectrum of the black body radiator. So this is what it looks like, this dashed line here. And out in the infrared, the rayleigh genes law matched it down here in the infrared. But notice how there's nothing that, that keeps this one over lambda to the fourth power from going to infinity when lambda gets small. 
And so the Rayleigh Jeans law predicts that at any given temperature, this is the amount of sort of the, the energy spectral density. So this is the density of the energy that's coming out of this object. If the Rayleigh Jeans law is true, at any given temperature, objects down here at the low wavelengths are emitting an infinite amount of energy. Well, that violates Newton's laws, right? Conservation of energy. You can't, you can't, um, you can't do that. Like you're not emitting an infinite amount of energy, <laughs> but yet you're at a temperature. <laughs> okay, so this this is what they call the UV catastrophe. When your theory goes to infinity and nature goes to zero, that's a that's a catastrophe for your theory. So you may hear that phrase or see it in in uh, you know vocab tests and so on. The UV catastrophe that's related to black body radiation, and Planck fixed that. Now, how did Planck know to fix that? Well, he read a paper from Boltzmann in like 1877, and Boltzmann was looking at the velocity distribution of gases. And he said, just to start this problem out, I'm going to assume that the gases only have certain velocities, like discrete velocities. So he could do a sum instead of an integral. Okay, the simplest explanation of what he was doing. And he said, I don't, I don't, claim that nature is quantized, but it's just for the math. Well, this idea of quantized, that was a germ of useful thought, okay? And so he used this, this uh, Boltzmann idea of discrete energies to solve the black body problem. So this is, this piece right here that Planck used is the Boltzmann distribution. And I think you should get familiar with that equation. We're gonna use it a few times. Uh, not this whole broader equation, but that E to the HC over lambda KT, that piece right there. That's the Boltzmann distribution. And what that does is it calculates the probability of being in an excited energy level if the energy levels are quantized, okay? And so if we were to say, uh, go out here onto the stairwell and I was just to say, get on a stair, right? and your choice of stair was related to your energy, then Boltzmann's distribution would, would tell me on average how many students were on each step, okay? So we throw molecules at a quantized set of energy levels, the Boltzmann distribution tells me how many molecules have each energy. Now, that's on average, some are gonna hop up while others hop down, but if I take the time average, I'm gonna say, all right, there's 15% in this level, 20% in that level, 14% in that level. And that's what the Boltzmann distribution gives us. So Planck used that and and his uh, theory matched the Rayleigh Jeans law at infrared ranges. And then when it got to the UV, it went back down to zero. And so this was the correct behavior and it was marvelous. Okay. So this perfect black body ir irradiator, um, it, they thought they understood black body radiation, but they only understood it in the UV, in the infrared region. When ex extrapolated to the UV, it went to infinity. Um, this is still how, I mean, we still use black body radiation today. Uh, you notice this fellow has his hand in a black trash bag. So in the visible region, you can't see this through the trash bag. You look in the infrared, you see his arm under the trash bag. This is how all of our um, night vision goggles are working, the thermal goggles. So they've got infrared detectors, and then they've got a way to sort of change that image into a visible screen, and then you can see that way. So this was a real struggle for, for Planck because he was saying something about nature. He's taking Boltzmann's mathematical trick and seeing that it applies in a totally different area. And again, is it just, is it just a mathematical formalism or is nature really quantized? And that was his struggle. He said it was using this quantized idea was an act of desperation. So he had struggled with black body theory for six years. So if you have trouble on your homework, don't worry about it. Okay. <laughs> I mean, how many of you struggled with a math problem for six years? I haven't. <laughs> I went for like six months one time trying to solve this differential equation and it got so bad I come home for dinner and my son would say, Dad, how's your math problem? <laughs> I was like, it's still not solved. Yeah, and so I gave up actually. 
Um, there were some solutions on a microfiche in a depository in New York, and then I got the interlibrary loan people to try to find the solutions, and uh, and the place had gone under, and so who knows what happened to their microfiche. And they found it. They found one copy of the table of solutions in the Royal Library in London, and they asked me what page I wanted a photocopy of. I was like, I have no idea you know, <laughs> what page in this book this is going to be on. So anyway, so. Good job, Plank. Uh, so he struggled with it. He knew the problem was fundamental and he knew the answer. And this is interesting. He had to find a theoretical explanation for black body radiation as long as it didn't violate the two laws of thermodynamics, conservation of energy and entropy, because those were the bedrock of society at the time. And still today, all of our mechanical physics is based upon conservation of energy and the role of entropy. So. So this was a, a, just a magical time in science. This is the 1911 Solve Conference of Physics. And this fellow here, Solve, Ernest Solve, number seven here. He was a rich guy, rich philanthropist, had a huge estate, kind of like a castle. And he loved physics and physicists. And so he would just invite them to his estate and they would all stay and they would get on the chalkboards and give talks and, and so, some of the most amazing uh, names you'll see here. Here's Max Planck here in the back. Um, here's number two is uh, Maurice de Broglie. So he's, we'll see him in a second. Uh, number three here is genes. When I talked about the Rayleigh genes law, this is the genes of Rayleigh genes. Here's Ernest Rutherford. Does anybody know what he did? Discoverer of the nucleus. Okay, so he's the one that shot alpha particles at gold film and saw a few of them bounce back. And he said, wow, there must be a strong nuclear force that's holding all the protons together to cause this, this alpha particle to ricochet back. He said it was like shooting a, a howitzer cannon at a piece of tissue paper and have it ricochet. So that's, that's how dramatic his result was. And he just made up a force. He just said, I'll call it the strong nuclear force that holds the protons together. Really dumb idea if you think about it, because protons are both positively, char positively charged. They hate each other. So how are you going to get them all in a thing you call the nucleus? He made that up, too. He was right, but he was like, this is the only way to explain what I just saw, is that all the big, heavy stuff in an atom is in a tiny space. And yeah, I know they're all positively charged. So we'll just say there's a strong nuclear force that holds them together. And sure enough, that's what nuclear power is based on and everything. Then over here, Einstein, look how young he looks. You normally see the white hair, you know, crazy hair guy. Um, uh, down here is Nernst. I don't know if you remember from Gen Chem, the Nernst equation, electrochemistry. Here's Solve. Here's um, Wien for Wien, Wien's Law. That was the black body stuff that he did. And here's uh, Marie Curie. That's cool. There's some other names that uh, you might come across in your studies. And so Planck <clears throat> in that Boltzmann distribution had this H, this, uh, this factor H, which now we call Planck's constant, okay? But at the time he called it the elementary quantum of action. It's sort of the tiniest little packet of energy you can get per temperature change, okay? It's 10 to the minus 34 joules per Kelvin. So one little Kelvin change will cause an energy change in 10 to the minus 34, you know, for a single little particle. Um, so they, they looked at this uh, photoelectric effect and they were looking at, you shine light on a metal surface. If you put it in a vacuum, electrons can stream off if the light is of a short enough wavelength you know, or a high enough frequency. I think in this case, it's frequency. So you have a high enough frequency of light, it hits the surface and electrons come off. They're called photoelectrons. You have photon come in, electron come out. And a lot of times this is taught in classes, the PKM classes, as a proof that light is a particle. Okay, because you can kind of think of it that way, right? If a photon hits the surface and a single electron comes off, how would you describe that as a wave? It seems more like billiard balls, right? You hit it with a photon and an electron comes off. One photon in, one electron out. And if the, inner, if the photon has more energy, a higher frequency, the electron comes out with a higher velocity, higher extra kinetic energy. And that's what's being plot here, plotted here. So notice this is kinetic energy of the photoelectrons. 
And so this this energy right here, <clears throat> if we want to have mv squared, okay, minus this work function. I don't know what you want to call it. Call it we'll call it phi. I've seen it phi threshold. And so we could predict what that velocity would be if we knew the the wavelength of the incident light or the frequency of the incident light. And this Planck's constant showed up right there. So this is called the Planck equation right here. And the slope of this line right here of those photoelectrons coming out of there was Planck's constant. So this was a confirmation that Planck's constant was a fundamental constant of nature. So that's the real big deal of the photoelectric effect. Now the reason the photoelectric effect was a failure of classical physics was that they couldn't understand this, this threshold value, this work function. Why would different materials have different threshold values? We now know it's the bonding electrons. How, how strong those electrons are held to the atoms is what gives us that work function. But if you don't have a quantized thought of the atom, you don't have a reason for there being a work function. So we still use this. Um, uh, well, the, yeah, this led to the description of light as a stream of particles called photons. Think about this if you're body surfing and you've got a big wave and, and that wave, you catch the wave and now the whole wave collapses and you go shooting off. <laughs> Right? That's a very, very weird description of, of this effect. So this really doesn't work well with the wave nature of light. It works great with the particle nature of light. And so that's, that's sort of the debate. And so this is the basis of our photomultiplier tubes and a lot of our camera elements and so on. Uh, but light comes in. It hits this photocathode and electrons shoot over to this collector. And you can detect the change in current or the change in voltage. So you can see little spikes of voltage, or you can see if it's a lot of electrons, you can measure the current. And so this is how we detect our visible spectra. Um, this is how we detect our, um, uh, our nuclear reactions, too. So any kind of high-energy photons are real easy to detect with photomultiplier tubes. So you can count individual photon events with a photomultiplier tube. You can multiply these, these uh, photocathodes so that you can get about a billion electrons for every single photon. So they hit, and it's like a dominoes, right? You punch that first domino, and then a billion of them fall. And then they reset uh, voltage-wise. As long as there's time to reset them, then the next, next photon comes in and knocks them all down again. So we can count individual photons with photomultiplier tubes. So this is what this idea is. If you have too low a frequency, then you haven't gone over that work function. If you have high enough frequency, you go past that, that threshold and the excess energy goes into the electron. So this is that now we have a high enough frequency of light. This is that work function and the excess energy from that light goes into kinetic energy. Now we can measure the kinetic energy of an electron pretty easily. If you think about it, it's got mass, a measurable mass, and it's got a charge. And so we can just make it curve a around a track using charged plates. And so if we have a positive charge on the inner plate and a negative charge on the outer plate, the electron will want to curve. And so we just change those charges a little bit. And if it's going really fast, um, then we can change the charge to turn it more strongly but the slow ones will hit one of the plates. They'll get sucked into the positive plate, okay? Or if it's going too fast, it'll hit the negative plate. So we can filter the velocities of these electrons using charged plates, and then put a photomultiplier tube on the other end, and the electron can cause an effect as well. So, so that's how we detect, and that's called X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. One of the most useful tools. So go ahead and write a circle around that or something. This is a, a very valuable technique
So uh, it's great for analyzing electron orbital energies. That's a long way in the future in this course. So we have about five sections to the course and I think it's section four. Okay, so don't forget about XPS. It's gonna be a while before we talk about it again, but that it's introduced here. It's the photoelectric effect. You hit it with light and electrons come out. Now, if we hit it with light, we can just basically get a picture of all of the different orbitals in the substance because all the electrons come out with different kinetic energies. So what about waves? I mean, the photoelectric effect really points out that, that light it could be a particle. Um, Thomas Young had an idea that, that, uh, that light was a wave because of diffraction. You can send light through a diffraction grating and you get a pattern of diffraction. And he said, this is so easy to solve with cosines. So light must be like a cosine. You can have interfering cosines at different frequencies and, and you get this diffraction pattern. Uh, but his work contradicted Newton. And so they said, no, this, you can't go against Newton. In fact, the, the, the response is kind of sad. He gave a couple of talks in London and the, the review of his talk was that it was destitute of every species of merit, meaning it had no value at all. And yet he was right. So whenever you hear about the consensus, that drives me crazy. You know, you don't, we don't do science by like taking a poll of scientists, all right? The poll was that Young was, was his work was garbage and he was right. Okay. So then we had a, another conference, a Solvay conference in 1927. Look at some of the new characters on, on the conference. We have Schrodinger here. So here's Schrodinger, here's Pauli. You guys will learn about the Pauli exclusion principle when you do the Aufbau filling of the atoms and so on. And here's Heisenberg, young guy here. Then over here we have Dubai. So they actually named the, the unit of the dipole moment after Dubai. Uh, let's see, uh, let's see six here, Bragg diffraction. Some of you are in instrumental analysis, and so you'll learn about diffraction, diffractometers and, um, and diffraction gratings. And so there's Bragg diffraction, and here's Dirac. We'll see some of his work in a minute. Einstein's aged a bit, he's gray now, okay? It's been, a, let's see, from, yeah, it's been 16 years since the last one, or the last picture that I have. Here's Max Born. We have, uh, an approximation in quantum mechanics where, where we say that the nuclei are so much heavier than the electrons that we can separate their motions mathematically. So like for the electron, the nucleus is st stationary. Even though it's vibrating all the time, the electron is one thousandth of the mass. And so it can move around and the nucleus is just barely moved a hundredth of an angstrom. And so that Born-Oppenheimer approximation, that's Max Born. And then here's Bohr, Niels, let's see. Oh, that's De Broglie. This is, this is uh, Max Born. And then here's uh, Niels Bohr. He's the one that came up with the solar system idea of the atom orbits. Planck is back, and so is uh, Madame Curie. This, during this time, she was separating train car loads of pitch blend uh, from different mining operations to extract radioactive elements. So she's dissolving rock, essentially pulverizing it, dissolving it, and, uh, and precipitating it out with sulfates and things like that. You know, barium sulfate is one of the like, best precipitates. You put uh, sodium sulfate in a solution that contains barium, and this white powder drops out, and it's very easily filtered. Okay, so she's dissolving everything in nitric acid, and aqua regia, and so on. And then she's precipitating things out with uh, sodium sulfate and pulling out barium. And some of the barium precipitate that she has is radioactive. And so what could that be? Well, if you look up here, right under barium is radium. And that's where this idea of radioactive came from, radium, radioactive, okay? She separated enough of it that they could put radium seeds uh, like into the body uh, to illuminate it, they could have fluoroscopes. She actually went in World War I and ran some uh, like crude x-ray type equipment. I don't know if you've seen the cartoons where the person stands behind the little screen and you can see their ribs. It's because they're standing in front of a really radioactive substance and there's a phosphor screen there and you stand in the middle and your bones 
stop the radioactivity. So it was so radioactive that they could they could uh, have it on the back of a jeep, lay the the um, uh, stretcher down, and they had the fluorescent screen on top, and they could say, "Yeah, there's the bullet right there," you know, deep in the person's thigh, and then they could go and cut it out. And so that was that's was just, just pretty awesome. <laughs> So let's talk about this uh, line spectra. You'll hear me talk about spectral lines the whole time in this course. So these are spectral lines. And why are they lines on a photographic plate? Well, because of this, the slit. See here, the light source is behind this wall and there's a slit here. The slit, the light goes through that slit, goes through the monochromator or the dispersing element and it, it's projected onto a photographic plate and the photographic plate is developed wherever there's light. And so they could not understand why like the hydrogen atom gave spectral lines or helium gave spectral lines or mercury or whatever else they put into the flame. So you can put elements in the flame and you get a different spectrum for every element. And so this line spectra was a mystery. <clears throat> they could see that it had regular patterns and, and Rydberg said, well, we could, we could look at these as, uh, you know, their position as relating to an integer series, like one and two and three and four, um, but they didn't know what those integers meant. So Rydberg actually discovered quantum numbers, <laughs> but they didn't know what to call them. They just said, this is interesting. We could fit an integer series to these lines, but what do those integers mean? I don't, who knows? Again, why would we think that math necessarily corresponds to something real in nature? Or is, is it just a formalism or is it actually describing something real. Uh, what's interesting is that Bunsen did this work and he invented the spectrograph here, but he got the Bunsen burner named after him. So the little light source that he used is the Bunsen burner. And then they advanced it up to a, like a electric discharge. This is, you know, less dangerous. Um, and so, but he, I think he should have gotten the spectrograph named after him. That's a much cooler thing. So these atomic emission spectra are quantized. They have very sharp lines, and those sharp lines tell us something about the differences in energy levels. And Newtonian physics just could not explain this. So this led to the idea of, of electron orbitals. Now, why would the electrons have discrete orbitals? And that's what uh, Niels Bohr was trying to, to trying to figure out. He he came up with this idea that um, that these electrons were orbiting the nucleus, kind of like planets in the solar system orbit the sun. Okay. And and so what didn't make sense was why the negative electron didn't just spiral into the nucleus, right? If you if you've ever played tetherball, you know you remember that game. You have it, the ball in the string, you hit it. And it spins, it orbits, but it gets, you know, slower and slower and spirals down into the nucleus. And and a, a charge that's accelerating will emit light. And if some a charge is rotating, okay, just an electric charge, it's going to emit light. And so it's going to be losing energy and it's going to spiral into the nucleus. So what keeps the electron out of the nucleus? This there's no classical physics this description of that. Only quantum mechanics can explain that. And so that's, that's where we are. So this old school Bohr model, the solar system model, doesn't work. You can pick the radii and you can pick it to match the line spectra. So it was an explanation of the line spectra, but the stability of the orbital didn't make sense. Just an orbiting particle of an electron orbiting a proton is not a stable system without this idea of wave mechanics. So De Broglie in his thesis, and this is great. You, you may think, well, you know, I might get a master's degree or, or a PhD and I'm going to write my thesis. And I mean, you know, it's nice to think it's going to change the world, but it's probably not. <laughs> right. This is your first academic work is probably not 
going to change the world. It'll change it in some way. You can't say it has no impact, right? But it's not as impactful as Du Bois' dissertation, where he, he was a, a, a big fan of classical music, and he was thinking about the violin strings and how they are quantized. And any kind of musical instrument, anything that has strings, that those discrete standing waves, when you pluck a string, it oscillates at a particular frequency that's related to its mass, the tightness of the spring, and the length of the spring, okay? And if you keep the mass the same, you keep the tightness the same, and you keep the length the same, you only have only certain options of what that string can do. It can be the fundamental, the octave, the octave plus some, and so on, and it can go up in discrete jumps. So that's how waves behave. So they're thinking these electrons, instead of being a particle orbiting the nucleus, maybe it's a wave and somehow, but what does a three-dimensional wave look like, right? It's easy to picture a guitar string, one-dimensional, but a three-dimensional wave, that may be not so easy to, to picture. So this was De, De, De Broglie's discrete standing waves. If you have that string, you can pluck it, and you could have higher uh, frequencies or higher um, overtones. Here's some vocabulary for you. The oscillating parts are called lobes. So this part right here is a lobe. And then these are nodes. And notice that the nodes increase as you go up, and so do the number of lobes. Okay. So these are nodes. Those are just places where the, the string is apparently still, okay? And these, you can, you can label them with an integer series, and so that's where the quantum numbers come in. So this idea, <laughs> it's interesting. Einstein read De Broglie's thesis. That's, that's pretty cool. And he liked the idea, and he knew Schrodinger was working on the electron orbital of a uh, hydrogen atom, simplest atom, let's pick that one. Uh, and he said, try this wave idea. And so Schrodinger took De Broglie's wave idea, learned about it through Einstein and solved the problem. So he fixed, he basically solved it using wave mechanics. So the mechanics of atoms and molecules, and this was the observed line spectra of hydrogen now, we know that um, hydrogen has the 1s, the 2s, the 2p, the 3s, 3p, all of those orbitals, right? Um, and we talk about the, like the, the 2p orbital, and it has m sub l, those quantum numbers, those tiny little ones, which the energy doesn't depend upon those unless it's in an electric field. And so if you put in an electric field, you get that tiny splitting, and that's what these are. These are the splittings from the m quantum number. So he, uh, he solved it not just for the principal quantum number, N, but also L and also M sub L, all these tiny little splittings. And here's what his math gave him. This is the theoretical down here. And then he's got some of these little dots, which uh, are sort of like um, possibilities, but with zero intensity. And so then some of these, he's got question marks on. He's like, these show higher intensity than what I predicted, but, but in general, it's a really good match. And so everybody was excited about that. Essentially, Schrodinger with his differential equation, which is on his tombstone down here. <laughs> okay, he solved, the, he solved the hydrogen spectrum problem using quantum mechanics. And then Dirac came in and extended it. So you'll see us this whole semester using Dirac notation. So this is Dirac. So like an integral over all space of psi, psi, uh, dx is equal to this. So that's Dirac notation using these little brackets as an integral. So whenever we see these angle brackets this whole semester, we're talking about integrals. 
And he extended this to um, multi-electron systems, which was not easy. And I can't really even follow this paper. It's very difficult. Um, so he said that it, it was such a good match with nature that this is his quote, the underlying physical laws for the mathematical theory of a large part of physics and the whole of chemistry. Think about that. He saw, he's saying this is such a match. We now know how chemistry works. We've solved chemistry. And he's, he's pretty, it's pretty true, okay? The difficulty is the exact application of these laws leads to equations that are just too big. The system, the number of mathematical terms is just too big for any one person to do. So that's why we built our supercomputers. <laughs> A lot of them is to solve some of these chemical problems using this math. Now, the very next sentence, he says, it becomes desirable that approximate methods that are practical in applying quantum mechanics should be developed that give us an idea of the main features of complex systems without too much complication. Com computation. Is that good? I, I want simple systems. Okay. And so you could do this with triple integrals and the hydrogen atom and R theta phi and so on. And the math would fill this board. Okay. And about halfway through, you guys would be glazed over. Okay. And I'd still be going, trying to write it up there, you know, and, and we get to the end and you're like, what just happened? I didn't follow you. You know, you lost me about halfway through. I was there too. I was like, my goodness, this is, and this is just the hydrogen atom, okay? And so uh, two things conspired against us doing that in class. One was when they cut the hours down to 120 hours for degrees and so on, they cut Cal 3 out of y'all's degree plan. Now you may be thrilled about that, <laughs> okay? But that really hampered our ability to do triple integrals, R theta phi, okay? And so I had to adapt to that and and start teaching it in one dimension just with a single string model. So I've been doing that for a little 10 or so years. And so that's led to this book project. I, in uh, 2019, I got approached by American Institute of Physics Press to ask if I would write the book. And so I said, yes. And so uh, this is how I teach it here. So if you get frustrated, you guys are in luck. The past students got frustrated. So they would look to see where my notes are in the, in the text. They're not in there. Okay, because I teach it this way in one dimension. So uh, now you guys have benefit because the deadline's September 16th. So I'm 95%. It's like some formatting things now, but I'm, it's done. And so I'll be uploading the, the chapter so you can read actually how and what I'm teaching you as opposed to the students before you who didn't have any help at all. They're just going from my notes. And, and we know it's not in any of the books because that was my grad student, Victoria, when she was getting her master's. She, I said, look in all the PCHEM textbooks that you can find online and we'll order some and so on for this teaching it in one dimension. You'll see the particle in a box mentioned in Atkins, but they stop at energy. They don't go on to the transition dipole moment and the intensity calculations and simulated spectra. So that's the new piece is actually simulating a real looking spectrum in Excel using one-dimensional math. Okay. So let's just kind of get our mind around how strange the atom is. So here we are in Huntsville, you see Target. Next time you go to Target, you'll see this big ball out front. And uh, one time we were walking past that ball and my kids and I, and I, and I said, man, what, what if that were a proton? How big would the hydrogen atom be? Like how big is this electron 1s wave function. And so this is how big it would be. If this were a proton, the 1s electron wave function on average would be 71 miles across. So just one hydrogen atom. If that, if think about how small that, that red ball is in front, of, in front of target. It's about a third of the size of this desk. If that were a proton, then the 1s electron would go from Livingston to Navasota. Yeah or from up to Madisonville, Love Lady, all the way down to Spring. That's a lot of area. And so when we're talking about chemistry, we're really talking about what the electron's doing. So, you know, if I'm coming up on a hydrogen atom and I hit Livingston, I'm starting to see that electron. Do I see the proton in Huntsville? No. 
I mean, it's a positive charge goes a long way. And so I would start to say, oh, there's a proton somewhere in Huntsville. <laughs> if I got inside of, inside of Livingston, if I got to point blank, I would know there's a proton in Huntsville. I'm turning around. Okay. And so that's where our vibrational motion comes from. The electrons draw the other atoms in and there's bonding and associations, but then they get too close to those protons and they turn around and go the other way. And so that's the oscillation that we see in vibrations. Okay. And this cloud, this three-dimensional cloud is oscillating. If you, next time you blow bubbles, okay, blow some bubbles and you'll see the little bubbles oscillate like this. So if we see that bubble oscillating and it's, um, let's, let's draw it oscillating like this, where it's bulging out at the top and the bottom, but bulging in on the sides. So I've just drawn like one snapshot in time of this bubble that's doing this. Okay. Where's the nodes? The nodes are right here, right? That's where there's really no change to the diameter of the orbital, is there? This is where the change is. And notice this has gone in, so we might label that negative. And this is going out, so we were going to label that positive. So the positives and negatives on orbitals are their deflections. Just like on a string, right? If we have a string and it goes up and down, we have a positive deflection and a negative deflection. These positives and negatives are not charge. This is all an electron cloud, so the whole cloud's negative. This is how that cloud is, is deflecting. So if we look at this at all angles from Huntsville, we notice that at this angle, there's a node. And at this angle, there's a node. And that these pieces are round. And so if we were to draw this, we would draw it like this. We would have a positive piece at that angle, a positive piece at that angle. And then around the middle, we would have kind of this donut piece that's negative. It looks just like that 3DZ orbital. So when you see that 3DZ orbital, that's this motion here of the electron cloud. So you can kind of picture it in your mind. Isn't that easier to think of than that? When you see that, you're like, what is that? You got different colors on it. You got a donut in the middle and the two dumbbells. And, and what is that? That's just this motion here of the 3D cloud. So hopefully now you've gone from a guitar string you can easily see that to this motion of a deformation of an electron cloud. And that's what Schrodinger did, and that's what Dirac did. They actually solved the math of that 3D cloud oscillating, and that gave us our discrete orbitals. So in summary, those four experiments revealed the quantum world. We just had to figure out the math behind it. So Schrodinger took wave theory and made quantum mechanics or wave mechanics. Um, and so it hasn't solved gravity yet. And we still haven't merged quantum mechanics in with general relativity or the standard model of cosmology. So there's still work to be done. Hopefully you guys are going to do something like that. So take care.